as you would have probably surmised. So I think if we keep to time, uh, uh, it will be appreciated. <coughs> Uh, could we ask Professor Kapuki to take a to join us, please? Uh, at the outset, uh, a few housekeeping issues. Is this audible? Uh, is this volume audible? Uh, some housekeeping issues. Um, the usual cell phone protocol of this event. It will be a video recording of the event. Uh, it won't go live, uh, but uh, it will be posted, I think, uploaded on the club site. Uh, Guru Dash will do that. And also uh, YouTube, it will be uploaded YouTube. So for those of you, and here uh, our uh, speaker tonight, uh, it will be available uh, in a couple of days, I guess. Uh, as a measure of uh, caution, uh, may I request everybody to keep their masks on uh, unless you're speaking uh, or asking a question at the end of the program. Uh, <clears throat> there will be a uh, small session after uh, Professor Taputi Gotakota's presentation, uh, question and answer or observations, and she might want to react. Uh, we'll do that uh, as time permits us. So without any further ado, let's start the evening. Uh, joining me, uh, I'm Moitro uh, and Raka Sen, uh, fellow members of the Library Committee of the Bengal Club. Thanks to our audience. It's an intimate one as the club embarks uh, in baby steps <clears throat> towards in-person events. The last such an event, as our librarian Shevonti reminds us, was way back in March 2020. And his wife, so that would be very nice, uh, representing the Victoria Memorial Hall. And we had a confirmation also from Mr. Shujan Mukherjee. Thank you very much. Uh, he, he's from the Delhi Art Gallery, Dagworth, and welcome, welcome Mr. Mukherjee, amongst us. Uh, so on to the evening. Owen Indranath Tagore was born in 1871 to the eminent and illustrious Tagore family of Jorashafo. His prodigious artistic talent, educated in Sanskrit and St. Xavier's colleges, he also took a few early art lessons. Eventually, he went on to head the art college in Kolkata in 1898, worked in the Calcutta University for a while and became the vice chancellor of Vishwa Bharati University in 1942, where the British lived, and black town for the natives. Avanindranath used the Bengali meaning of, the, of Jora Shanku, or double bridge, to develop the image of a mythical map of the city. The map was of Hali Shahor to appear as the central guide in the children's book, Putur Boy. Much as we tried, we couldn't get an image of Ali Shah. And maybe in the course of this evening's presentation, we might get some clues as to where we might be able to lay our hands on that. When pamphleteering and publishing were gaining ground with many names foregrounded in Bengal, Aubun Tagore's versatility spilled over generously to the field of literature. His literary oval grew simultaneously with his art. His writings spanning several genres, Indian history, mythology, folklore, and memoirs. Most of his prose have a luminous pictorial quality set 
His story begins when he jumps on a lame goose, learning to fly and brave difficulties. Ridoike, Dana Mudhidye Shubajoni Kura Hash, Ei, Amaitumi Aramiraku, Amitumai Boromiraki, Boli Horil Upor, Arami Boshi Gum Ditelaglu. Also, Rajkahini, or The Story of the Kings, a popular classic of 1905 about the various kings of Rajasthan, essentially a retelling of the annals and antiquities of Rajasthan by James. Tokhun Rat Kete Shabe Shakal Hutche, Dur Teke Kamal Mir Ashpashto Dakhajatche, Sheishumai. Prithiraj ghora theke ghure porlen rastar dhuloi ar shei shomoy shonger adrishto ashar abhinir shur bajiye dile bhor bhai bhor bhai there is a strong thread of fantasy in avantagor's works which creates a magical effect a landmark in children's literature, Khirer Putul, is a clever study of extremely complex, correct human behavior. Interestingly, Khirer Putul has a translation in French, which was published in 1950, called La Poupée de Fromage. The Memoirs of Avantegor reveal an uncut honesty to capture his childhood. There are quite a few essays on art and the art of painting too. The following lines from Shilpayam can be read with much profit to pave the way for any discussion on the art of Abhinindranath Tagore. Akdike Roilo J. Artist, Arakdike Roilo Rosho Upobhukta Roshik She, Edike Roilo Baganir Malik, Odike Roilo Baganir Malik, Maji Roilo Hulir Mala, Nana Koshale Gatha. Hello, to help us enter and savor this world of Obontego's art. We are honored and fortunate to have Professor Tabuti Bhuvan Hakurta amongst us of the Center of Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta and founding convener of Jodunath Bhavan Museum and Resource Center. She has written widely on art and cultural history of modern India. Over to Professor Tabuti Bhuvan So it is a special occasion. I'd also like to thank you for those very beautiful readings because I think they set the context for my talk. Uh, why books like Kire Putul, Guru Angla, Baj Kahini, Nalo, uh, they remain some of the most treasured memories of our childhood, certainly for most of our generation. 1951, he passed away at the age of 80. Uh, Omar Thakur, as writer, storyteller, artist, uh, is to me, I think, more spoken about and referred to than fully known. Now, there have been a body of very significant writing on the art of Omar uh, Two very important books on the extraordinary diverse output of his works which remains really a kind of landmark work which has brought so much of Abhinindranath's works into that light. And I'd also like to refer here to another very important book that has been written by Devashish Banerjee, great-grandson of Abhinindranath, called The Alternate Nation of Abhinindranath, which is a very, very favorite book of mine. Both these works, uh, which Both these works have gone a long way in retrieving Auburn Indranath Tagore 
from the narrow nationalist confines of Indian style painting in which his image remained trapped and still remains trapped in a way, the history of India's artistic modernisms of the early 20th century. Now, this has been a very important work that they've done. But outside these scholarly and corners of Aubameyang, still remain largely a covering the, his entire career uh, in the city, and they're now housed in its two largest public museums, the Indian Museum, which had the earliest collection of Aubameyang in his lifetime, so far as they were a larger literary and artistic project that can bring into closer conversation the two inseparable facets of Aubameyang's creativity, his writings and his paintings. These would be some of the large initiatives in which some of us could come together as a collective to rediscover Aubameyang for our times. One of the best ways of remembering Aubameyang is by entering his own enchanted world of remembrances, which was partly referred to. alongside the social and cultural activities of the remarkable Jola Shako household to which he belonged. His creative life, that Aubameyang, he saw himself, gave himself over to a world of wistful memories and magical storytelling, with the children of the house as his chosen audience. So in Apur Katha he writes, Shishude Shange Amar Bhav, E Lekhata Kodet Chonno. His main impulse, he wrote, was not to record a document, but to tell stories. And he makes this wonderful distinction between Hishabir Khata and Golpir Khata. And he said, Beshi tarik din khan dile sheta hishab hoi jai. Kintu golpo bolte ho Now in translation, he wrote, and I quote here, the mind was like a tangled net full of holes, collecting some remembrances and allowing others to slip through letting a few pictures emerge in minute detail and lead himself earliest and which were published in journals between 1927 and 38, well before they came out as a book in 1946. The other two are called Khorwa and Jola where he narrated the story and Rani Chondo wrote. Uh, these and these were published in 41 and 44. So these are all out in Aubameyang's last decade of his life. These memoirs have provided us with a rich stock of material for reconstructing Aubameyang, who juxtapose the artistic profiles of the early Aubameyang, which is largely conceived of in terms of a nationalist phase of his writing and painting, particularly with what I would like to think of as a post-nationalist Aubameyang, to mark his passage from a public to an increasingly privatized domain of art, and to pursue his paintings through the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, long after he recedes from the center stage of modern Indian art. Aubameyang's name, let's take on the name of the Bengal school. There can be no doubt that the narrow label of Indian style painting is one from which Aubameyang has remained in grave need of extrication. What it obliterates is the versatility and variety of his work of the later years, the interactive development of his pictorial and literary imagination, and the introspective fashioning of a creative personality that was as gifted with words as with visual images. Yet the question remains, how effectively can we pull the artist out of his nationalist past and script a new role for the latter day entirely against the grains of the institutional and professional worlds of modern art activity in the country of this period? I'll begin with early Aubameyang. With the artist's own recapitulations of his early career, Aubameyang remembered in Gorwa how the spirit of Shadishi arrived at Jola Shako house like a powerful gust of wind sweeping them all along in its path. 
he recalled, as I felt that a frenetic burst of activities at Rola Shapo, spearheaded by Rabindranath. The setting up of a Shadeshi Bhandar uh, to manufacture cosmetics, soaps, even shoes, the pouring in on front, the closing of kitchens or on Dhanut shop to mark the black day of the partition of Bengal, and not least of all, Rabindranath's brainwave of the Rakhi Bandhanut shop as another partition ritual when they all took to the streets of Chitpur to tie Rakhis on the wrists of their Muslim neighbors. In Abhinidranath's reminiscences and in art history, Abhinidranath's nationalism would always be staged as a straightforward choice between Western and Indian art, Biliti and Dishi, between the drill of academic training to seek towards the mastery of what he would call his Deshi Ghalana. His artistic reorientation, he tells us, came out of an encounter, firstly with an album. All these in the family collection, I doubt that they're there anymore, but I don't know where much of this went. So that's why I put the date there. That's as far back a time when I first began working on our Indrana. With the common qualities of fine craftsmanship and decorative design. As he experimented with these resources, scholars have traced in his work a medley of influences, uh, ranging from Mughal and Rajput miniatures. Uh, on the left, clearly, it's the provincial Delhi Kalam. We see a distinct stamp of that. The middle image is clearly drawn from Kamra Bahari miniature painting. And on the right, we even see uh, a whiff of influence of pre-Raphaelite and Art Nouveau trends. If you look at the drapery, there was a lot of uh, pre-Raphaelite prints that would be doing the rounds. Now, these stylistic influences we find would shape the trajectory of the entire body of his early works. But even the encounter with Western academic art that Aubameyang kind of rejected cannot be written off in wholly negative terms, as the artist would have us believe. His early training and life study can be portraits of family members that he continued to produce through at least up to the 1920s, if not 30s. So he continued to produce these amazingly sensitive and beautiful portraits. The one of Rabindranath is perhaps very well known. It was gifted to Jagadish Chandra Bosch and it's part of the Bosch Institute collection. But it's a lot which was in the family collection which are now finding their way into uh, these galleries. Um, now, we would have to think between the art of Ravi Varma and that of Abhinendra and the claims and counterclaims of nationalism that emerged around both their works. This is something I've written about several years ago, so I don't want to enter that here. This and medium of painting, but also in Abhinendra fashioning of his own persona and practice. As he gets commissioned work and commercial success that marked Ravi Varma's career, Abhinendra upheld the ideal of the artist as a pure genius free of the travels of education and training, free also of the demands of a profession and livelihood. All along, Abhinidranath would constantly associate art with a romanticized notion of shock as against shikha. If this was the privilege of his aristocratic lineage, this was also the essence of a new notion of modern art as a personalized universe. Uh, Ravi Varma excelled in that. Abhinidranath rejected the demands of realist simulations along with the medium of oil painting and evolved the counter style that deliberately underscored the materiality and tangibility of the painted image. The Japanese painter Yokoyama Taikan and Hishida Shunso at work at the Jorishako homes. They had come on the invitation of Kakuzo Okakura in 1902. After a preliminary drawing, Layers of color wash would be applied, dipping the whole paper in water after each coating to let the tones get denser and darker and sublimate the drawing. The, 
and a smoky, evanescent haze. Such a style, it was then widely believed, served as the most appropriate vehicle of the new spiritual and transcendental aesthetics of Indian art. Obadigana during these years would draw a fine line of distinction between what he termed Rupatok and Bhavatok paintings. One was dominated by the skilled workmanship of line, form and color, the other suffused primarily with mood and emotion. A painting, he argued, needed to be stripped of its outer trappings of beauty to allow the inner reserve of feeling to manifest itself. This is case of how Abu Nirnath implemented these ideas. The first painting in the series on the left, The Bathing of the Taj, was based on a direct emulation of the techniques of Mughal head drawing, architectural decoration, and wash coloring. The shift is played out in the second very famous painting of Shah Jahan and Ritu, the passing of Shah Jahan, where the artist, even as he inserts an abundance of Mughal architectural detail, and you see the amazing finesse of that, substitutes the bright colors of the miniatures with the van hues of the night sky. After all his intricate work on the architectural facade of the Agra of the dying emperor, to him, this orchestrated, as nothing else could, the inner pathos of the picture and played out its central theme of the transitory nature of life vis-a-vis -vis the immortality of art. Painted in the wake of the death of the artist's young daughter in the Calcutta Plague of 1902, the artist reflected on how he had poured his personal grief into the image of Jahanara, faithfully attending to her captive. This was the essence of the Bhav Banjana intensity of feeling that he saw himself as adding to the Mughal technique of the painting. And this is what would give his work its status in the words of E.B. Havel and Sister Nibedita as a masterpiece of modern Indian art. The transition from detailed workmanship to pure mood was to be fully effected in the third painting of the series the one on the left, uh, titled Shah Jahan Dreaming of the Taj, where the frail figure of rust and brown, the murky layers marking the experimental technique of the wash. And with time, they faded even more. The wash had its strong parallels within the Nihonka art movement in Japan in the same period. That had been pioneered by the visiting artists, Yokoyama Taikan and Ishida Shunso shades of light and dark to establish shapes without strict boundary lines. Of course, the Moratai technique would travel a long way from 1890s when Taikan is first experimenting with it. What is also fascinating is the way these two Japanese painters and Yoshua Katsuta, also called Katsuta Shokin, who followed to Calcutta, turned to the painting of Indian themes. So we saw it here, that's a painting by on Ram Shita and Lokhan. And we see this in this very famous painting of Yokoyama Taikan, which is at the National Museum of Tokyo. What is interesting is how a near identical language of aesthetics and art criticism resonated across these select circles of Nihonga and Indian style painting, setting out the same binaries between the academic realist art of the West and the spiritual idealist art of the East. Subtle art, art, this aesthetic had to continuously contend with a parallel thrust towards narration and storytelling, which is something Aubrey Brunach never ever gives up. His passion for illustration and storytelling. His first full series of Indian style painting titled Krishna Lila, where he grafted on the style of the 19th century miniature painter and even learned the techniques of applying gold leaf, was appended to transcripts of verses from Joydev's Gita Govinda. The following more mature products of his Indian style painting, like that he did do. Uh, this was commissioned for Edward Fitzgerald's 1910 translated edition of the text. Experimented with the ornamental calligraphy, evolving a Nashtalik style lettering for his signature, even though it's in Bangla, and we'll be seeing it in several of the works. And uh, for a signature, 
and for the verses in Devanagari and Bengali that he would add to many of his paintings, Abhinandranath would cast himself in the mold of a medieval miniaturist and folio painter. At this point, Abhinandranath here turned compulsively to the stylistics and aesthetics of the wash as a means of transcending the work of illustration and transporting his painted images into a desired zone of spiritual affect. There would also be a significant makeover from illustration to allegory within Avanindranath's paintings of this first phase, where he begins to evolve his own repertoire of literary and historical iconographies. I'd like to just show you a few examples of these. Um, let us take the case of this painting called Ashoka's Jealous Queen Dishwara uh, I wish the colors were slightly better. Uh, anyway, I think it's also the light that allows it to fade. Where he takes up the legend of the queen's hatred and destruction of the sapling of the Bodhi tree, which he saw as a right to constitute a historical setting, even as he creates an iconography of the Shurukhita that has no precedence in India's ancient Buddhist art. Called The Last Journey uh, or The Last Burden, he turns to the naturalist finesse of animal studies in Mughal miniature painting in this image of a camel lowering its burden in the red glow of a sunset sky and creates around it the allegory of one who had arrived at the end of life's journey. So this journey's end is a later title that is added to it. The master miniaturist is able to, on his return from the art school and keep picking up curious from, where the way he depicts him, he could well merge into one of the medieval Persian characters from Omar Khayyam's poetry that Aurobindranath was visualizing in parallel. Now during these years, Aurobindranath's influence as the pioneer of Indian style painting would of course crucially devolve on the positioning of his work in the public domain. So however much he may have disavowed the world of professional art, the early national in public spaces of the public engagements of his art. Here at the Government School of Art, uh, Calcutta, in its grand new relocated home on Chorungi, flanking and internally linked towards the grand world's new edifice of the Indian Museum, become the most crucial of these public venues of our Indranath's operation. It is here in the late 1890s that he meets the reformist art teacher and ideologue in the Havel, then principal of the Government School of Art, Calcutta. It is through Havel's article on him in the English Journal that began acquiring the selection of Aubameyang's early works for the Government Art Gallery, which were then integrated with the art section of the Indian Museum under Percy Brown, and would remain the largest public collection of the artist's works to be made in his lifetime. Most importantly, Havel was able to induct Aubameyang in 1906 to the post of Vice Principal of the Government School of Art. The artist's memoirs take pride in recounting the special stature he enjoyed within the school, the freedom he was granted, and the alternative ambience in which he worked as a guru, watched by and watching over a select circle of students. Yet, however alternative the milieu, there is no denying that it is in this formal capacity as an art school teacher that Aubameyang would most effectively garner his first and most important band of student followers, and that it was within the classrooms of the government art school that the entity of Indian painting became a teachable and impartable genre. Uh, very tragically, Aubameyang's arrival coincided with Havel's departure. Havel went on sick leave, intending to return, but he never could. So in some ways, Aubameyang has to take on the helm, and there's a constant conflict with Percy Brown, but he's given his space. But this is an important, where we recognize many important figures. Right seated is Kitty Ronath Mojumdar. Uh, Nandala is there next to the sculpture. Opposite him is K. Venkatappa, who came from Mysore. Uh, was sent by the Maharaja of my soul. There, Aubameyang there. There's somebody called Hakim Muhammad Khan, perhaps the only Muslim student then, but we never hear of him after that. 
and then next to him on the right is Shurendranath Ganguly who died very young. So this is his first batch of students. The master's inspiration in aesthetics alongside the training in indigenous methods of color preparation and painting imparted by the traditional painter Ishwari Prashad whom Havel had brought into the school. So that portrait by Havel is by Ishwari Prashad, the one we saw. And the training in techniques of Japanese painting given by Katsuta Shokin, a visiting Japanese painter at the art school uh, during 1907-8, now established the model of Indian art pedagogy that was crucial to the making of the movement. With Obanitunath's resignation from the art school, uh, the dates are either 1912 but most probably 1915. The pedagogy would be relocated at the precincts of the Indian Society of Oriental Art that had been set up in 1907 uh, and the new Bichitra Shoha that had been formed within the number six Jurashako House. Among the society's main activities were the holding of art classes, with two also organized annual exhibitions along with talks and discussions on Oriental art, sponsored artists to go on study tours to sites like Ajanta, and published an exclusive art journal called Lupon, edited by O.C. Ganguly, that later became the Jisua, the Journal of the Indian Society of Oriental Art. Continuing in the tradition of the cultural clubs of Jurashako, hosting evening gatherings around poetry readings, plays, and musical performances, the Bichitra Shabha would also function as a regular art studio where Avanindranath and his team worked to pointing out. So this has remained one of the unforgettable, jovial image of the culture of Bichitra. As elite culture clubs, the society and the Bichitra Shabha were spaces that were as open as they were closeted. Even as they marked out their exclusive circle of connoisseurs, collectors and cream, and to art as a creative vocation. More than orders and purchases and more than exhibitions, it was reproductions in books, journals, and art albums that was to sustain the main public profile of Owen Indranath's paintings, in tandem with the works of the whole group. Taking center stage in this history were a new crop of highbrow illustrated periodicals and the advancing technologies of color reproduction. The lead was taken, and this will be familiar to many of you, by two remarkable miscellanies in Bangla and English, edited by Ramananda Chatterjee, Prabhashi, and the Volume Review. That began, one began circulation in 1901, the other in 1907. And not least of all, we must mention the special technology of three-tone color block printing that was pioneered by Uri and Sons at Godbar Road, which allowed this very fine color plates to be produced. During the first two decades of the 20th century, making these available regionally and nationally to a growing middle class readership. Now by laying out this public field of location of Auburn Indranath and his group, I'm arguing that the real significance of this that it created for modern art activity. With this new art movement arrives a new circle of art journals, critics and connoisseurs, a new middle class art public, a new premium on the cultivation of tastes, new forums for exhibiting and viewing. With it together, these lay out the critical new social space for modern art practice in India. Establishing it as an autonomous domain outside colonial institutions. Subsequent modern trends in Indian art, even as they abandon the constricted formal of Indian painting, remain firmly grounded in this institutional site. Towards the end of the second decade of the 20th century, we find Ogunindranath's gradual self-release from this public domain and from the circuit of art classes, exhibitions, and publications. With the next of circles, like especially in the world of Shiv Kumar, it's clearly laid out that the best of Abhinindranath is to be discovered in the works of the later years. When I read to of Nandalal Bosch, his favorite pupil, from the Bichitra Studio and Society of Oriental Art, to the position of principal of the newly established Kala Kamal in Shantanikapan. Rabindranath's move of weaning away his closest disciple from what he saw 
as the hothouse enclaves of Yorashako and the Oriental Art Society, to the openness of the alternative art institutions he set up in Shantaniketan would radically reflect itself in the break in Nandala's own style and in the course of the Indian art movement. So these are paintings Oberinder Nath does soon after his return from Ajanta, where he had gone with Lady Herringham. And his reinvented style would now become, as we see, where nature, brushwork, coloring would now take on a whole new charge. Uh, where his art continued and bar murals to Japanese woodcuts to rural portraits. This was also the time when Auburn Indranath's first batch of students began to fan out as art teachers to institutions all over India. A spread that began with the master's own resignation from the government school of art, Calcutta. So I won't go into the list here, but Shamar Indranath Gupta was appointed vice principal of the Mayor School of Art Lahore as early as 1914. Soon afterwards, Shailendra Nath joined the Bharat Kala Bhavan in Benares and then Jaipur School of Arts. Between 1920 and 25, Oshit Haida moved from the Shantiniketan Kala Bhavan to Jaipur School of Art and later to Lucknow. And there's a kind of long list of how the students begin to move from Lahore to Colombo Avanidranath students took over art institutions all over the country. In a letter to Havel, Avanidranath talked of the scattering of the seeds, the fruits of which will be gathered by future generations. Elsewhere, he also remembered this as the time of, he sardonically said, Digby Joy, the Bengal school's conquest of all directions. Seen in hindsight, the sense of success and gratification can be piquantly counterposed with a sense of release and responsibility of having to lead the movement. In the nation's modern art history, the 1920s presents itself as a crucial conjuncture. On one hand, as I've said, we see the all India diffusion of the Bengal school and its institutionalization in art schools as a thriving system of pedagogy and practice. On the other hand, we witness a clear breakaway from this model of Indian style painting into new languages of expression, abstraction, and affect uh, in the painters of the Shantiniketan and Kala I'm going to just run through some of these. Uh, in the new experimental series of Cupid's compositions that his brother Gogolindranath began to develop in the 1920s following his direct encounter with the works of the Bauhaus group in the exhibition that came to Calcutta in February 1922. And not least of all, in Rabindranath, modernism chart their own whimsical course through these years, swinging between exotic fables, popular folklore, nonsensical humor, and nostalgic storytelling. The cultural milieu of Jola Shaku and the activities of Bichitra Club, however, continue to provide a major mooring to Avanindranath's painting activities. Particularly important was the thriving world of amateur dramatic performances at Jola Shaku, so richly remembered in his memoirs, in setting the tenor for creative artistic experiments in the household. So you have Govindranath, Avanindranath, and Govindranath. Both Avanindranath and Gogonindranath were reflected in the inspiration he drew from stage props, screens, and lighting in the structuring of his Kyrgyz compositions. And here, this is also the use of Japanese screens, which come through very, very sharply. Sometime around 1913 14, Avanindranath painted his first genre of theater pictures, later listed as his open air play or Jatra series, where he interpolates Far Eastern looking figures playing, acting their roles as Roti and Kama, with local Jatra actors whom he calls costumes as kings, captive heroes, or later as a portable-made Mohadev also here. Yeah. But I'll go to that later. Okay. Devashish Banerjee, in his close analysis of this open air play series, traces in them the influences of Japanese kabuki performances which were carried into circulating woodcut prints by ukiyo-e artists like Sharaku, 
Underlining the cosmopolitan and local blending of Aurobindo's characters, this series, the Jatra series of the Open MP series, inaugurates an on-running pageant of stage performances of Aurobindo's paintings. Where he next takes up Rabindranath performing the role of the blind bar in his dance drama Palguni. These are the 1916 paintings. Matching these paintings with his detailed recollection of the backdrop of the night sky that he and Nandala produced for the play, we can also see them as fashioning a new genre of manifested in his figures of the Jatra series with Mahadev that he follows up in 1918 with his illustrations for Rabindranath's Dhamdarpur Parents' Training, a biting parody of modern education, and a rare caricature of a fake ascetic. A persisting fascination with his Mughal past leads him to produce during the 1920s a set of remarkable portrait and contemplative portrait of Emperor Aurangzeb called Alamgir. That is Aurobindranath's only large, massive painting done in the form of a triptych. It exists in Nandur Museum, Kalapapon Shanti Niketan. I don't know whether it's been restored, but it very badly needs to be brought into the public domain. It is a remarkable work. And one of the most sensitive portrayals of Aurangzeb, where he enlarges scale and does it in the form of a Japanese triptych screen painting. I don't have an image of that, and I didn't have time to write to Shufkumar to ask him to send me one. Uh, landscapes and bird and animal studies would also emerge as important new areas of the artist's work. Um, the styles are often carried over from his earlier work. The birds and animals he paints in heavy somber tones and contours take on more elegantly orchestrated and colorful profiles in his later Playmate and Pigeon series, where they assume the role of magical talking creatures and mythical friends from the fables of Hitopadis during 1925-26 of the Tagore Zabindari estate at Shahjad Pur in East Bengal. In these blotted compositions, soaked in watery blends of blue, greens, and yellows, his wash style is used with optimum effect to create a feel of the riverine landscape of the region. These are possibly the last of his wash paintings. And they would soon find his achievement, his master achievement as a painter. In a close scrutiny of the series, Shiv Kumar argues for the artist's passage here from illustration to narration. Uh, a new tenor of contemporary facticity and inventive storytelling. As the artist searched out a present urban setting and a contemporary cast of subaltern characters from the environments of Jorashaka and Chitpur. In one of the paintings, for instance, on the marriage of Nuruddin on the right, a backyard with servants, dogs, cats, half-open doors and curtain blooms are laid out as different floor segments of a house where the hotel logo on it, are made the target of seduction of the three sisters who in the story wanted to respectively marry the king of Persia, his, his cook and his baker. In the most discussed of these paintings, the hunchback of fishbone, which is on the left, uh, the artist brings in a slice of his own family history through a signboard of Darakanath Tagore's entrepreneurial firm, Kurt Tagore and Company, that appears on a scene of a dinner party at the Tagore home amidst the maze of uh, the one on Abul, Abu Hussein. You can hardly make out the story, but he would really inscribe these stories in the National District. What is novel is his mode of re-narration of Shahzadeh's stories and the representation liberties through which he inscribes his present into the mythic past to craft the distinct modernity of these paintings. They conjure a vibrant cosmopolitan world of characters that he plucks out of the fables and reimagines them in a contemporary setting, as in the painting on the right, or Sinbad the Sailor's Last Journey to Hindpa, where the aged Sinbad that he sits narrating the stories becomes the alter ego of the artist himself, surrounded by a pigtail Chinese, uh, 
a Muslim priest, a turbaned Hindu, an Afghan, and an Englishman on a chair to complete the group. Now, this, these paintings have been analyzed in excellent detail in Shiv Kumar and Devashish Banerjee's book. Never published nor made available for public display, these paintings when I first encountered them in the 1980s, pulling them out of a trunk in the storerooms of the Romero Bharati Society left me amazed that they unfold. Over Indranath's painting of the series coincides with the pegging of the first set of his memoirs up on Kotham and the bringing forth of an unstoppable flow of stories of his own life and times. Like the legendary Shah Zadeh, who kept spinning stories for King Shahriyar through a thousand and one nights to defer her own annihilation, Oberindranath, the painter and writer, now turned to nostalgic storytelling as his way of keeping at bay the changes and erosions of the present. There would be brief interludes of public engagements in between. One of these was when he joined as professor of fine arts at Calcutta University as a Bhagishwari professor and delivered the set of 29 lectures on aesthetics and philosophy of art, but as he recalls, to a largely empty hall. So this is something I always remember of Anindranath saying that he delivered them to a largely empty hall. These lectures would find their more effective afterlife in print as a collection of essays titled Bhagesh Chodesh uh, I am coming to the end. I realize we've run out of time. There would be a long stretch after he painted the Arabian Night series, uh, roughly from 1931 to 38, when he stopped painting altogether and instead took to composing popular Jatra ballads, palagan, and stories from the Ramayana. This became the new obsession of the elderly artist, filling page after page with palagan, uh, which were meant neither for publication or performance and illustrating a book manuscript with collages that he pieced together with throwaway items like cigarette packets, cinema handles, and chocolate wrappers. This book called Khude Ramayon or Khuddu Jatra has now been brought out uh, by Putin Khan and it is again a marvel of work, but it was never meant, it was done for his grandchildren and never quite meant. Invents himself as the writer of the old-fashioned forms of the Puthi and Pala. So from the miniaturist, he's moving into the, the writer of Puthi and Pala, inflecting the folk genres, again with the resources of this contemporary urban milieu, peopling his tales with servants and street folk, peppering his Bengali with the pigeon Urdu, Hindi, and Uriya dialect. This you see in the stories like Khatamji Khata, Badshahi Goipo, Chonchol Kovita. At the end of the decade, when the artist returned to painting, he would, in a matching vein, recast his style in the mode of the village potuas of Bengal. He also now moves from Sanskrit and Persian poetry and exotic Arabian legends to the medieval literary genre of the Mongol cultures of Bengal. Between 1938 and 39, in the last prolific spurt of pictorial activity, Obadindra not produced close to 60 paintings. 33 paintings are called the Kobikam Panchundi series, where he follows the character of the hunter Kalketu and his wife Pullora uh, in Mukundalam Chakrabarti's Chandi Mongol. And in the other set is called the Krishna Mongol, which I am showing here, where he visualized life from the miracles of the child Krishna, particularly his slaying of various demons. So this is the set that I'm showing. Obunitana one could have authenticity in the art traditions of village India. In a similar time frame, we see Nandalal Bosch appropriating the style of Odisha Potajitros to paint his famous panels on India's rural life and culture for the Holy Guru Congress session of 1938. Known as striking is Jamini Rai's turnaround during these years from his middle-class academic art practice to the idealized world of the rural scroll painter and terracotta craftsman, his retreat from Calcutta to his village home in Bakura, and the inculcation of his modern folk style. Abhinitrinath's vernacularization of the forms and contents of his painting at this juncture needs to be brought face to face with these surrounding modernist trends. Uh, I've been 
to leave out the last set, which were, I just run through them, which I think again have hardly been written about. These are his mask series that he draws out of the theatrical performances in the Jalashaka household, uh, where we meet several characters from the family. Amazing set of pictures, again, which were never published and have hardly been in the public domain. And we also meet characters, sometimes untitled, like the image on the right, Aryan, nine years of paralysis. So really, covering the not the last years of his life, he could not work at all. The most cruel blow came the next year, was the sale of their house among the five Darakanata Orlean, and his displacement to another residence, rented residence, Bukta Nibash, in the northern outskirts of Wadamago. One of his autobiographical short stories from these last years, Mashi, is brimming with the memories of his home and the poignancy of its loss. As Aurobindranath turns himself into the child protagonist of the story, who relives the lost past of the house through the streams of remembrances of Mashi, his old aunt. The tired architectural spaces and the bustling activity of the Jorashako house while it crept into so much of his paintings, stories, and memoirs, all where he writes, the edifice of art has a first, a second, and a third story. The ground floor was a place of work and laborious preparation, where servants toiled and craftsmen manufactured their elaborate wares. The floor above, the first floor, was the Boitokana, the salon, the halls of leisure, recreation, and social, along with artists, musicians, and dancers, got together to exercise their judgment and share the appreciation of art. The topmost floor was the Andal Mohal, which to Abhinindranath was also an Andal Mohal, an enclosed inner chamber, where the artist was completely immersed in his work, nurturing his art like a mother rearing her child. Abhinindranath admitted that the genius could be produced at all three levels, within the artisans, within the critics and connoisseurs, but he unequivocally separates himself from the artisan and the critic to shut himself into the top floor, into the Tetalar Andor Mohal, where his art became a world into itself, <coughs> liberated from effort, fame, and proper floor. A strangely anachronistic figure, the old man turned into a child, modeling an array of odd shaped goblins with stone and driftwood, his cartoon Putum series, miniaturizing the whole world as he playfully observed it from the wrong end of the telescope. In returning to these passages in his memoirs, in this image of the old artist turning into a child and the wonders of being small, I return to find my own solace and redemption amidst the devastations of the present. Thank you. Uh, that was monumental, Tokoti. Uh, you deserve a seat uh, and, and a moistening of your throat. May I request uh, Dr. Omita Chatterjee? <coughs>
a lot of us uh, are still not out of view. What effort is being made by uh, the authorities? And then to ask the question, some of us have been writing on our meeting months for a while, but I think uh, one major move was when Aurelianat's paintings, the bulk of his work, uh, were released from the trunks in which they were stored for decades. And how was he interested in selling them? So what Havel acquired, he did in an early, those were early Aurelianat. The bulk of his work, all the series that I've shown, Aurelianat Togo gave to the Rovindra Bharati Society, which had its offices in the number five house. Now, they brought it to me. And of course, the, uh, the Rovindra Bharati Museum has some things. But the best of Aurelianat and Aurelianat were in this collection. Now, some years ago, finally, the Victoria Memorial acquired the custody of these on lockdown. So right now, they are in the stores of the Victoria Memorial. They've been conserved, they've been digitized, or they are being digitized. And it is sincerely hoped that there can be an organ in Ranat's chosen space, just as my golf club would not have been the chosen space <laughs> for my talking about it. But nonetheless, it would be important because that is where it exists. I mean, the best and the, the largest collection, small amounts were sold in Aubrey Ranat's late years when the National Gallery of Modern Art is being set up. Aubrey Ranat, some of his books are going to the sense somewhere. But the bulk of it is here. So whether in the Victoria Memorial or elsewhere, we do need a gallery dedicated to the memorial. It's taken over. There's literally Harald that will gain. But this material really needs a space and rotating display. Absolutely, and one can do many interesting things there. Uh, I'd like to say here that very recently the DAG arranged a tour and we visited the Kornagur Bagambari that belonged to Gunendra Nantago. It was a lovely space and we were thinking it would be wonderful to take some of Gunendra Nath's even there. So there are lots of spaces in the city where Gunendra Nath, if in this 150th year we don't bring his work out, it will be such a pity, right? Because, you know, over so many years that I've worked, I've never been able to take people on a tour of Aubrey Bernard's paintings, right? Because, or even of Aubrey So we are hoping now, at least they're in hands where one can assume that we will be moving. And it's not enough to have them digitized. One needs to, and they're already very fragile. And they gave us laid in trunks for years. Also, there's no full catalogue of it. You know, what Mukul then Rinab Bihari did is what we have. You know, the backs of the pictures need to be seen. He's writing all over. So that detailed work of inventory also needs to get done. Actually, we found we visited in Jona Shako. We found works abroad. National treasures, so actually, Aubrey Rinab cannot be sold abroad. But his works have traveled. How about the museums or galleries abroad? I mean, you are there at Moya? Well, it's because it's they in, preserve, you know, they it's, preserve them better than me. Sure, but I think the private commercial art galleries are, are not that has traveled. Uh, but I don't know. I think collections have moved. But as I say, the best and the bulk of Aubrey Rinat's work are right here in the city. And actually, in fairly good conditions, still. Fairly good visited Rovindra Bharati Jodashaku campus, uh, we heard from the museologist here that uh, they have uh, all over but some of the city, city, unlike <coughs> so many others works, which left the city. So Gangadhar Bush is more in ancient way. Right and I think that's what he would have wanted because he said was his also, he's prolific, so even putting it together was uh, somebody who was, uh, you know, definitely uh, aware of his own privilege and promoting this idea of the art, training a whole generation of people to then find 
art as a profession because I'm sure most of them were not coming from similar backgrounds. So in terms of, is there any instances or do we hear about the kind of, at that point of time, uh, barring say the whole move towards in fact craft or administration etc. What would have been some of the lessons conveyed in the college of training a generation on and how would Aubameyang himself come to terms with this whole, uh, you know, diplomas that Aubameyang uh, speaks to that as he withdraws and when he says uh, he would go to the art school, life study, and he said, "Art to shop like I need, art money, art monthly. Now that rhetoric, as it's true, the artists need professional training and the artists need a livelihood. And that is reflected in how his students, each of them needed jobs, right? They were from middle class background, not only himself. So they are not coming from the same aristocratic leisure background, which is why already even in the government college of art, you have Indian faculty take over. Mukulde becomes the first principal. Right? Before that, the Jamini Prakash Gambhuri. So, Aubameyang's tenure is something that he looks back as something that he did, but not something that he ever valued. But I say that it's absolutely crucial. Without the tenure, he would not have developed that forward. Almost pushing away that professionalism, and yet he is in the public domain. And that's why I'm saying that without the public domain, and without the institutions that grew up, from art reproductions to journals to the Society of Oriental Arts, spaces of exhibition, the movement would not have taken on the scale it did. So, Aubameyang is anachronistic. He refuses to belong to his own time, right? Which is why the sale of the Jara Shako house really destroys him. Because I don't think he could ever come to terms with moving to a rental. Aubameyang detailed catalog of over 300 paintings, miniatures uh, that they collected. They were collecting a lot, and tabkhas, and sculpture, which Srimati Tagore, who had married into the family, who's a Gujarati, this thought would be dispersed. So when the number five household is sold, she sold it to Kasul Bhai Lalhai, and today it's in Ahmedabad. So, but how many of us even know about that, right? So, I was amazed it's Aubameyang's own catalog writing where he gives up. So, think of the late Aubameyang when he gives up his art collection to be sold. He has to give up the home and he moves. So, in some ways, he's pining continuously for the past. So, I think that's the image with which I finish. So, that's why I said Aubameyang both belongs but doesn't quite belong to this world of professional modern art that he nonetheless pioneered in such a Could we just repeat that what shows? What awards? Oh, yes, he did. There is something called CYE. I think it's called something of the Indian Empire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Commander, so he's, uh, Commander of the Indian Empire. Of the Indian Empire. So he has his European pictures. So these are inner contradictions that are there. But I don't think he valued these awards very much. There are no awards in those days. Right. So, uh, the Padma Shri and all come up much later. So, there are no awards. It's painting very self. But, so, there's this small early period when his works are selling, largely bought by the patrons of the Society of Oriental Art, some have other files. After that, he withdraws. And think of works like the Arabian Nights. I don't think he even meant these to be exhibited. He is working for himself. Now, that's almost impossible for you to understand a mindset like that in the years. And like, for example, Chotetra writes about how he has visited to stage dark part. And uh, also, I guess, uh, Binod Bihari also uh, recollects a certain parts about, you know, exhibiting that uh, flute player, I think, like, and they both paint the flute player and the differences. So I was wondering, uh, what was Aubameyang's reaction to the uh, new say, or was he, how was his, uh, like, how would that work? 
saying it doesn't exist, but I haven't come across Owen Indranath responding in any great detail to say the words of Pinod Bihari or uh, Ram Kinko. Not that all, of course, he continues to be extremely, you know, fond of, and Owen Indranath remains his guru. So the story is that when he does become Upachacho, he would sit in Rabindra Bhavan and Nandura would first come and so he's there, he's this figure, but I don't think he ever enjoyed the institutional charge. I mean, it was, he took it on because I think you know, he was the obvious person to take it on. But I don't think he ever flourished in these institutional roles and responsibilities. So I don't know, maybe one has, in Jorashama Thare one doesn't come across very much, which is the things that he's right narrating there. It's entirely a look back to that world of Jorashama. So, Abhinima belongs to Shantini Kutan, of course, and there is, there is his work in the London Museum, but he never really writes very much in Shantini So that's the other thing. But Dinod Bihari is the first to catalogue his work, to a very, very detailed catalogue. So, all good things have to come to an end. So, we are already in our evening program with a little felicitation to our speaker. And we are really, really. <laughs> you have taken us to the world of Open Internet and in another. Phase transported completely, and what an eve. We are also organizing a physical meeting. So, on behalf of the Library Subcommittee of Bengal Club and on my personal behalf, I thank all of you who have come in this evening to listen to this Omnidanath narration. And of course, we are all grateful to others who have acted behind the scene and very happy. So thank you once again for your time. Thank you so Thank you.